Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT to 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together. Here at Vail, one of our core values is to serve sacrificially. We believe that you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. If you haven't had the chance to jump onto one of our amazing serving teams, now is the time. We are in need of people like you to help us accomplish the mission we are set to do. There's a place for you to plug in, whether on the weekend or throughout the week. If you're interested in this opportunity, simply text SERVE to 309-777-0677 or swing by the info desk in the lobby and someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We believe that everyone has a next step in their faith journey, and we want to help you take it. If you're looking to take a next step of faith or looking to get plugged into community, let's move there together. You may feel like it's been too long or you're not sure yet. Connect with our team to help you navigate your questions. Take that next step today by simply texting NEXT at 309-777-0677, and a person from our team will respond, and we will help you move forward together.
Hey everyone, my name is Zach. And my name is Sean, and we are so glad you logged in to join us this weekend. We're so excited about it. We know there's a lot of things you could be doing on your weekend, and the fact that you chose to spend an hour of your time with us, it means the world to us. If you're new, we'd love to share real quick what's gonna happen today so you know what to expect. All in all, we're gonna be here for just over an hour. We're gonna start by singing together. We love to worship loudly at Vail, so go ahead, turn your speakers up and follow along with the words in the bottom corner. After that, we're going to hear a great encouraging message. We will provide you with next step opportunities in your faith journey, so please stick around afterwards. Throughout the service, we will have the chat feed open for you to share your thoughts and dive into online community with others who are literally watching around the world. That's not a joke. We are so excited for all God is doing here at Vail. And we believe that watching Vail Online, it's a great first step. So as you check us out today, I would love to invite you and encourage you to come and join us in person at one of our upcoming weekend experiences. Listen, our service times are shown below. You, your family, and your friends will have plenty of space with full programming from birth to adults. Vail is consistently growing and expanding to bring more people into the church. And we believe in community and would love for you to be a part of what God is doing here at Vail. We hope to see you in person real soon. Yeah, like maybe next weekend. Like right, right now. Or now. No, well, next they weekend. They can't next, next weekend. We'll, we'll see you next weekend. Well, anyways, this service is about to begin, so open up the Veiled Church app wherever you are, in your car, laying in bed, on the couch, making breakfast. I don't know. Maybe you're actually watching Worldwide doing one of those traveling things. Guys, just come visit. That's all. Anyways, hit the full screen button, and let's jump into the service. We love you. to Bill. We're so glad you're here. If you're in the lobby, come on and find a seat. We're going to start, we're going to sing, we're going to worship, give God glory together. Oh, days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, and you're rising higher, with power to save, with power to save. So we believe that you keep hope alive. You keep hope alive from the beginning to the end. Your word never fails. You keep hope alive because you are alive. Jesus, you are alive.
God, we are so grateful. We are so thankful for who you are, for all you have done for us. God, we are so privileged to be able to worship you in this moment. And so right here, right now, we welcome you into this place. We thank you for being a God who is with us, for being a God who loves us, for being a God who died for us. May the rest of our time give honor and glory to you. We thank you, we love you, and it is in your name that we pray, amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome everybody, it is good to see you. My name is Corey, I've got the privilege of serving on the team here at Vail. It is good to see you guys in the room. Have you guys joining us online? Wanna give a special shout out and welcome to our first time guest. If you are visiting with us, we are glad that you are here. Hey, if you are visiting with us today, we would love to connect with you this week. And so if you could text the word NEXT to 309-777-0677 or just fill the card out from the seat in front of you, drop that off at the info counter. We would love to connect with you this week. Now, hey, if you're here in the room and you've got elementary age or younger kids, you need to know about Vail Kids. Every weekend, every service, Vail Kids creates a fun and safe environment where your kids get to learn about the love of Jesus in a way that is gonna hit them at their age level and they will have a great time. And so you still have time, if they're with you right now, to go across the lobby and go check them in and they would love to have you guys over there. But if you wanna stay together and worship as a family today, that is all good too. We know that sometimes, like you know this too, kids can get a little bit restless if they're sitting 
been sitting too long and all that stuff. And so if at any point you feel like you need to step out for a moment, that is okay. In fact, out those doors to the left, we've got an area set up where your kids can get some energy out with some books and some toys, and you can stay engaged with today's service through one of the TVs that's out there. Now, we wanna let you guys know, in case you were like not aware, next week is Easter. We're excited. We are excited for what's gonna happen here at Vail, and we want you and whoever you're inviting to be a part of it as well. And so I wanna let you know what the service times are. Next Saturday, we're gonna have two services at 4 and 5.30. And then on Sunday, we've got three experiences that people can participate in at 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.45 a.m. And we are excited for you to come and worship with us and for whoever you are inviting to come join us as well. Now, as we get ready for our sermon and our message today, I wanna encourage you guys to stand up, take 30 seconds, say hi to somebody, and answer the question, what service are you gonna attend next week? 30 seconds on the clock, here we go. Hey, what's going on, Vail? I hope you had a great week. I think I heard someone say they're attending all five. I heard that. Someone's like, all five. So you can hang out with us. I know we have amazing people, amazing volunteers are gonna make that happen. Hey, if this is your first time, my name is Sean Jensen. I have the privilege of serving as a lead pastor here at Vail. And uh, we're gonna jump in to a Good Friday message today. And, and we talk about Good Friday. And I've heard a lot of people say, Sean, it's kind of crazy that we call something Good Friday when it looks like anything but a good day. It's the day that Jesus was crucified on the cross. But what if Jesus' darkest day actually is gonna lead to your brightest day? What if it actually is a Good Friday because of what Jesus has done? And so we're gonna talk a little bit about Good Friday today. And next week, we're gonna talk about the resurrection, but we can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. And so we're gonna kind of lean in that moment today. We're gonna be in a scripture of Mark, 14. If you're new to church, we'll have it on the screen here for you. But what I want to tell you is in this moment, Mark was actually friends with Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus. And so Mark is writing down the Last Supper account that Peter had with Jesus. And this is the moment we're going to look in today. It says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? Before we continue on, I'm going to take a moment to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom as we unpack what this is all about. So, Lord, we thank you for the time of worship, but, Lord, we don't, we don't want to go through the motions. We know that you want to do something powerful today, and I can sense it in my heart. There's some walls that have been built up that you want to tear down today. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would give you full reign to do what you want to do today in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, before we continue on, I did forget to welcome our online guests. Can you help us welcome them real fast so we don't forget? All over Illinois, Florida, Indiana, we're glad that you're here. Uh, I want to ask online and everyone in this room a question, um, and it's going to be like this. If you ha were ha about to have your last supper, what meal would you choose? If you were about to have your last supper, what meal would you choose? Or someone's like, I'm gonna go for the basics, some steak and potatoes. Anybody like, I, that's where I'm going. How about some tacos? Where are my taco people at? Uh, how about pasta? Like the more the carbs, the better. Who's like going with like Hot Pockets or Lunchables because you just can't like escape the fact, like you're like, it is what it is. We're my cereal. Like people are like, I could do cereal all the time. I know exactly the meal that I would want, but I'm not gonna tell you because every time I tell you about my favorite food, someone ends up buying me a gift card. And so I'm not gonna use this platform <laughs> to do that. But I got one in mind, okay? So I'm not gonna use this for that purpose. But the idea is Jesus's last supper, his meal is having this Passover meal. Now the Passover meal was lamb, 
right? It was lamb, bitter herbs, and they would actually roast the lamb with, uh, over fire in that last. So Jesus' last supper was a lamb, but there was actually a big significance on why they chose to have this lamb. It's said in scripture, a sacrifice lamb to celebrate the Passover meal. Now we're gonna actually have to understand that why Jesus did this is actually super important, but we're gonna have to go back in time. And as we go back, I'm gonna tell you it's significant for us today as well. Sometimes we do this whole church thing and we forget why we do what we do. And so I kind of wanna unpack what this last supper meant, why Jesus was having lamb at his last supper and what the Passover meal means. So we're gonna go back a thousand years to Egypt, all right? So we're gonna go back to Egypt and in this moment, The Israelites, the nation of God, have been in slavery for 430 years, and Pharaoh is ruling them and reigning them, and they're crying out to God. It broke God's heart. And so in this moment, he sends Moses to actually lead them out of Egypt. And so God uses his 10 plagues to loosen the grip of Pharaoh on the Israelites. At the moment we're about to read, he has used nine plagues so far, and he's about ready to lean into the last one. And we're going to read a lot of scripture here just so we understand what's going on. And this is God explaining what's going to happen in this plague so that they could be set free from the Egyptians. It's a little heavy, but we'll explain it after. It's in Exodus 12. We're going to read throughout 1 through 13. It says, while the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. I told you, it's just going to get darker. (laughs) They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord." but the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. So as we look at this moment, oh yeah, sorry. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. So I know that's a lot heavy. And after reading that, let's just be honest, if you're new to church, you're like, I got more questions than than answers out of that. And one of the questions might be like, why would God do something like this? Why would a loving God do something like this? And I can understand from face value why you might look at this moment and say, if God is loving, why could he end up doing something like this to the people in Egypt? But if I could maybe turn that around and ask you another question, if God were to leave the Israelites in Egypt in slavery. The men, women, and children just left them there in slavery. Reminder, Pharaoh was also killing like firstborn males at this time. Would God still be loving? I I think we would end up at the same place, say the same thing. If he kept them there, we would still end up blaming God. And that's kind of the logic behind how we as humankind can actually blame God for a lot of things happening in our world. And we forget the whole reason all this stuff is taking place was not because of what God had done. It's because of what man had done. And so in this moment, God is using this to free the nation of Israel And so we have to kind of lean into this moment on why God would do this. And so we're going to unpack what this means for the Passover lamb and what this means for us. And we have to start with this. We were slaves to sin. Remember, we started this mess. God created something great. He wanted to put his creation in it. He created amazing things for us. And we decided we knew best. And man, I do that from time to time. And in that moment, we live in a fallen world and things lead to one another. And now in Egypt... We have the nation of Israel who's been in slavery for 430 years. That's like generation and generation and generation. After that much time, I mean, that's just heavy. That's just broken. Like, God, you remember us? Remember who we are? Remember the promise you gave us? And in this moment, God actually hears the cries of his people and he begins to intervene. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why did it take God so long? I know it's another complex question, and I just want to let you know this one, and why would a, God, a loving God do this? In a few weeks, we're going to start a series called Skeptical Christianity. If you are skeptical, or if you have friends who are skeptical, bring them out as we uncover those types of topics. But in this moment, we're going to talk about this idea 
that Jesus heard their cries, and his timing is usually the best timing, right? We were slaves to sin. The truth is, is even though these people were slaves to sin in Egypt for 430 years, today, right now, online, in this room, and all over, people may not know this, but there's a bunch of people that God loves who are still slaves to sin. There are still people who are bound every day. There are still people who are stuck every single day. Now, you may be looking at me, and you might be wondering, oh, I don't know about that. And you might be having the same response that the people in the audience of Jesus' time had when he said, hey, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And they were like, wait a second, what did he say? Did he say if we know the truth, the truth will set us free? And they had this moment where they were like, I didn't even think we were bound. Look at this moment, John 8, 33 through 34. They said, we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean we will be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. So in this moment, what Jesus is saying is he goes, I'm making this connection that remember your ancestors and the nation of Israel Remember this moment that they were in slavery in Egypt. He's making the connection that even though they were rescued out of Egypt, there's still this Egyptian thing that we are bound to, and it's not Egypt, it's sin. And so he's coming and showing this picture that God sent Moses to deliver the nation of Israel from Egypt, and now God is sending Jesus to save mankind from the slavery of sin. That's what he's saying in this moment. He's actually encouraging them by saying, I have come to do something a little bit bigger. I'm going to connect this with you. So how do I convince a bunch of people? This is so difficult, I found out, because we don't like to talk about sin. It makes me feel icky inside. That offends me, right? Like, we don't talk about it. But here's the word with sin. Sin just means we miss the mark. God has set a mark for us, and when we follow after God, he's got things going in the right direction. It's amazing. But what happens when we miss the mark, we don't realize it, but we begin to actually find herself in bondage. Now, how do I convince a bunch of people that they're still in slavery to sin? That's tough because I can tell you one thing, it was hard to convince me when I was there. Actually, I was kind of having the time of my life. I tell people all the time, if you're not having fun sinning, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> like, can he say that? I'm leaving this church. Yeah, you're probably not gonna like it if you didn't like that. So, because <laughs> sometimes sin feels fun. Can I be honest? Sometimes it feels liberating. It feels great. The truth is, though, when it comes to sin, when we try to convince people, I've realized that sometimes we actually get more stuck than we think. We get stuck in this thing that is a repeated cycle. I think of it this way. Sin looks like freedom, and it leads to slavery. But truth looks like slavery, and it leads to freedom. Have you noticed this? That a lot of times the thing that we think is, I don't need restraint. I gotta live my life. We end up actually in more bondage. But the life that we think is, that's just restraining me. I don't wanna do that. It's actually that lifestyle that will lead to freedom. There's this difference. And so how do I convince people that the way that we are living and what that looks like can be a little bit different? You see, Paul actually called himself a slave to sin. Paul, who wrote scripture, called himself a slave to sin. In Romans, he says this way. He says, don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Look at this. Do you realize? He goes, thank God. Once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Do you notice that Paul actually uses the word slaves for both ideas? Slave to sin, slave to righteous living. I don't think that's like an encouraging thing to say. Like, Paul, if you want people to follow Christ, maybe don't call them, I don't know, slaves. But what Paul is trying to hint at is he says one is a harsh master and one is a great master. And what he's trying to say is, yes, you can be a slave to sin and it can feel fun. As the Hebrew author might even tell you, the fleeting pleasures of sin. But he says, no, actually you'll end up being a slave to one that will have a harsh outcome or you'll be a slave to other and you'll see a different outcome. You see, I found out in my life, 
<laughs> that being a slave to sin can actually lead to more bondage and being a slave to truth in Jesus can lead to more freedom. Culture might tell us that just sleeping around with whoever we want is just enjoying the human experience until we find out that we have so many soul ties and emotional ties that we bring into our next marriage. And we're bound. Culture may say that when you're stressed out, just run after the alcohol. It's all right. But then you learn that every time you're stressed out, maybe I need more. And then what happens is we forget that every time we're stressed out, instead of running to the presence of God, we now have confided in something that we think is stronger. And we begin to be bound. Or maybe, just maybe, we begin to envy those around us. I know I do. And so us running to Target, we make funny jokes about how much money we spend at Target, and it's cute and it's great. I get it. But let's be honest, we can't stop spending because our eyes are focused on everybody else. And if we could have their clothes and we could have their appliances and we could have their life, and so we spend more because we're jealous and we're envious. And honestly, we have no hold of our money. And now we don't even have the money we're spending. We're just throwing it on credit. And we're bound. You see, you may not know it, but this type of lifestyle will actually lead to more bondage, but yet God still sees us like he saw Egypt. God still sees us like he saw the nation of Israel in Egypt. And so what did he do? He did not send Moses to lead us through a Red Sea. He sent his own son to deliver us from sin once and for all. And so Jesus is on earth and he comes. So how does Jesus free us from the slavery? What does he do? We have to talk about the lamb that was slain. The lamb was slain. We were slaves of sin. The lamb was slain. We see this actually in the moment in Exodus as we continue on into it. We have, we, the moment in Exodus where we have, where they talks about the, the defect lamb. Do we have that on the back screen somewhere? The, the Exodus, there it is. You guys are gonna have, I don't got my notes. So you guys are like everything <laughs> to me right now. So cool. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice. One animal for each household. Remember this? It goes on to say, the animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. So if you've been around church life or if you listen to the radio station, you have heard this word lamb a couple of times, right? You've probably heard it in the songs that we sing. You might've heard it in an exchange with someone and you might've come going, man, I don't know what it is, but churches really love lambs. It's this little fluffy thing. I mean, they're cute, right? But actually, the lamb, it's got a bigger significance. There's a bigger symbol on what the lamb actually means. And that's why we're looking at the Passover moment. You see, this lamb is a symbol, and it's a bigger idea. There was this moment where Jesus is actually turning 30 years old. He's on earth now. He's about ready to start his ministry. His cousin, John the Baptist, we'll call him John B., he was actually a few months older than him. Only my real fans will get that one. <laughs> you all shaking your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Bring it home, John. Anyway, so... So John B., right, he's a few months older. He's baptizing people outside of the city limits in the Jordan. He's calling people to repentance. He's saying, Jesus is coming. Change your ways. Let me baptize you because Jesus will be here. Jesus shows up to one of these baptism parties. And when he shows up, John B. sees him and he says this in John 1, He says, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As soon as John said that, everyone in that place knew exactly what he was talking about. They began to look at this man who was Jesus, and he said, there's the lamb. As soon as he said this, the people who heard the story of their ancestors back in Israel knew exactly what he was talking about when he said lamb. They knew about how the lamb was sacrificed in Egypt. They knew about the Passover moment back in Egypt. And so when Jesus was approaching the scene, they realized this wasn't just another man. This was the lamb that will be slain for us. He was the lamb that would come in our place the lamb that would be slaughtered for us. You see, we believe that Jesus was that lamb. But after he became the lamb, we have to realize it wasn't just the lamb that slayed us. We don't just celebrate the lamb. He was a perfect and spotless lamb. Remember, the scripture said, don't just get a lamb, get one with no defects and is spotless. Second Corinthians 5.21, Paul tells the church in Corinth, he said, for God made Christ the lamb who never sinned 
to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. What does it say? The one who never sinned, the lamb with no defects, the lamb with no blemishes, the lamb who had never sinned will become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's why we don't just celebrate the lamb, but we also talk about another weird thing. We talk about the blood, the blood that was shed. You see, you probably have heard this before, and maybe if you're new to church, and I've always heard people make jokes about the idea. They say, what are some weird things you heard about church growing up? And man, we heard them. I remember the one was like, plead the blood. <laughs> like, like, what does that mean? Can you imagine someone coming in here for the first time? And it's like, Lord, cover us in your blood. <laughs> It'd be like, what does that even mean, right? Like, I don't know if I want to come back. Why do we talk about this blood? Well, the blood is a symbol, right? The lamb would have to be sacrificed. Have you heard the phrase blood, sweat, and tears? That phrase is a phrase that means sacrifice. Do you know how much went into that project? For me, it's often that blood, sweat, and tears that start the project, cut my finger open, blood goes everywhere. Not really sweat, mainly just tears and blood. That's usually where I'm at. But blood, sweat, and tears is how much you put into whatever is going through. See, the sacrifice was a symbol that the blood was actually going to be shed from them. Can you guys uh, put the back, whatever's, can you hand me my paper right there? Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, throwing, a, I'm, throwing, a, I'm throwing a fumble, I'm throwing an audible here. So I don't got my teaching tea thing and we're just trying to figure some things out. So I'm gonna put this down here. How about that? All right, there we go. The blood that was shed. All right, we're gonna get back into this. The author of Hebrews says this, in fact, According to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So we have to understand this. There was the slaves, the lamb, and now the blood, which was a symbol of the blood that was shed. He said, back in Moses' time, everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now listen, it wasn't going to be the life of the lamb that saved them. It was going to be the death of the lamb that saved them. Super important. Hebrews goes on. It says this in the next scripture. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Now, this is a lot of stuff that's happening here, but let me let you know what's going on. In the Old Testament, the high priest would have to make a sacrifice of a lamb to purify the sins of the nation of Israel. And he would do this annually. Every time they would sin, they would have to slaughter an animal to make an offering to cleanse them from their sins. It was a temporary fix, not a permanent fix. It was a temporary thing, not a permanent thing. Jesus wants us to know that in this moment, it was temporary. But Jesus, he said, why would he come and die again and again and again? He says, no, Jesus was perfect and he died once and for all for our past, present, and future sins. It's not a temporary thing now. For those who put their trust in Christ, it's a permanent thing because of what he has done. So it's super important to understand. Listen, I know a lot of people are very inspired by the life of Jesus, and I get that. There's a lot from his life that can inspire us. But I want to tell you this, although the life of Jesus can inspire us, it's only by his death that delivers us. And so we have a lot of people who celebrate Jesus and he's a good guy and he's awesome. And I would try to follow in his footsteps. But here's the truth. If we don't accept the cross, we don't accept our sin. The life of Jesus might inspire us, but it's only by his blood that will deliver us from the bondage that we are in. And this is very true, especially in this culture right now, because Jesus is a really cool figure to look after. But we have to remind ourselves, Jesus did not come here to make bad people good. He came here to make dead people alive. And that's what we have to do. And so when we look at the gospel, what he's saying is the lamb came and the lamb was slain. And, and now we have a bunch of people who are so inspired by the life. But this is what we have to understand. The cross reveals how much God loves the world and how much God hates sin. 
We gotta talk about this. We can't be a church who doesn't talk about the one thing that Jesus came to liberate us from. We gotta we got talk about it because this thing that we don't talk about sometimes, we love the cross and we celebrate the cross because it shows how much God loves the world. But when we accept the cross, what we are accepting is we were the sinners that put Jesus on the cross. And so even though the life will inspire us and it should, it's the cross that delivers us from our sin. Just like the lamb that was slain in Egypt, our lamb, Jesus, was slain to deliver us from our life. See, a lot of people, we love the love of God and the love of Jesus, but we forget that there's also justice. And God sets us free by sending us his son. So we were slaves of sin, just like the people in Egypt. The lamb was slain. Jesus was put on that cross. His blood was shed for the atonement. That's the really churchy word, to purify us from our sins, to cover us just like they said in Hebrews. But it's only gonna be the faith that saves us. That's the last thing, the faith that saves now, we have to be very careful when we move into this moment because if you're not careful, what we think is we have to leave now and figure out a oh, good way to go on God's good side and that's not what I'm trying to get at. We have to understand that the people in Egypt had instructions from God. They had instructions to do what they needed to do, but they had to actually put it to action. You see, it takes faith to put God's word into action and that's exactly what they did in Egypt. Hebrews eleven twenty eight 28 reminds us that it was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. See what it says? It was by faith that Moses commanded the people. It was by faith that they actually did this thing. It was the faith that moved them to action. Can I tell you that faith isn't just believing in the word of God. Faith is also doing the word of God. Now, we have to be very clear that we don't misunderstand this because what we're looking at is this moment that we see the Passover lamb sacrificed, the blood goes on the doorpost, and if the blood was on the doorpost, they said that their firstborn would be okay. It was faith in that. Now, I want to be clear. It's not our works that get us on God's good side. Like we don't have to, oh, what's the doorpost look like? Do we have to go and do these different things? Paul tells the church in Ephesus very clear. He says it this way. He says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See this? Grace, Sean, what is grace? Grace is the undeserved life we get by believing in Christ. He took the death we deserve and he gives us the life we don't deserve. It's the unmerited favor of God. That's what grace is. And how do we receive it? Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. Here it is. Not by works. Not our self-righteous acts. Not what we do. Now, could you imagine, let's just play this together. Could you imagine that back in Egypt, they get these instructions. God tells them exactly what they need to do. And so I got my Egyptian door here, I think. That's the close equivalent. And could you imagine as soon as they get the instructions, they're like, not on my watch is my firstborn going to die. So they head over to Best Buy. I don't know what they called it back then. <laughs> but they got a security system. They're like, you know what? We're good. We're gonna make sure that there's no angel getting past these doors. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna catch it and put it on TikTok and everyone's gonna see this ghost and they're gonna realize this is what it is. And then what if they go, you know what? This may not be good yet. I got an idea. We're gonna make sure to board up this door because I'm for sure not letting my firstborn get taken out. So I got these boards that for sure, I mean, you can't fit through there. Look at that. There's no way. <laughs> Only a small human being could fit through that door. Like, you know, they're feeling pretty good about themselves. Like, oh no, this is pretty good. But like, you know what? I need something else. I, just need, I need one more thing. I got an idea. I need a bodyguard. That's what I need. I need a bodyguard. Come here, John. I need you for a second. Come on up here, bro. I appreciate it. I wanted to find someone bigger than me, but I ended up having to find John instead. So <laughs> you stand here. All right. 
Now, you don't make sure no one gets in this door. He's huge, isn't he? Look at this. <laughs> Hopefully he's here. <laughs> get out of here, dude. I think I like, as soon as he walked in, the, the, I was in the gym once and he walked in, I just walked out. <laughs> like, I was like, that's this kind of gym, okay. So we got our bodyguard. We got our stuff secure. We got our security camera. No one's getting in here, right? The instruction was, you need to put the blood on the doorpost. But you know, I got this. And this is kind of what we do, by the way. When we know that really by God's grace and his gift, and we have to believe it by faith, he, he tells us how to come to him, but instead, what do we do? I'll just work harder. That's what I'll do. If I can get my church attendance up, that's gonna protect me. That's gonna take care of my sins. You know what? I'm pretty much a good person. Like if it was like 75, 25, for sure 75 was me being a good person. I, I, I throw some money here and there to people who need it. I'm mostly, a, I don't lie too much. <laughs> I do my best, I, I give, I'm generous. And what we do is we try to protect ourselves with our works. And, and Paul says, it's not by works so that you can't boast and I can't boast. Do you know the only thing that we had involvement with, with our salvation, was the sin that put Jesus on the cross? That's the only credit we can give. What'd you do? I sinned. What'd Jesus do? He died for me. So instead, you can go take your seat real quick. Instead, oh, you're gonna clap for John? All right. <laughs> I would too. Instead, what did he say to do? He said, take the lamb. And I want you to, Paint it. On the doorpost. Right? Woo! But what does this mean? He said, now if, if the blood is on the doorpost, if the blood is on your house, if the blood can be seen and you're behind it, you're fine. The angel will just see the blood. But if you're in front of it, you're not safe. The only thing you can do is by putting your faith in what? The blood. As long as the blood is shed and it's on the doorpost and you're behind it, you're safe. And we have a lot of people trying their hardest and doing their own works and trying to get safe. And so this moment, they realize that when you're behind the blood, what happens? The angel will pass over. Will pass over. And so Jesus' last supper, he's celebrating the Passover. And they're having lamb at the table. And it's in that moment the disciples realize Jesus is the lamb. He is the Passover meal. He is this. And whoever put their trust in Christ, it says, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross, his blood shed on the cross, and you put your faith in that finished work that he rose three days later, they say, you're behind the blood. And as long as you're behind the blood, God does not see your sin. He does not see your shame. He doesn't see your mistakes. He just sees the precious blood of Jesus, and you have been purified and cleansed, and you are good to go. So here's my question. Are you behind it or are you in front of it? Here's my question for you. Jesus paid a high price so you could paint your doorpost with blood. You're like, Sean, how do I paint my doorpost with blood? What does that mean? It means you just put your faith in the precious blood of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus. Maybe you're here and you don't know where you are with Christ. I came to tell you he is the Passover lamb. We were slaves to sin. The lamb came and he was slain. He was perfect without blemish. His blood was shed on that cross. And it's our faith in that work that saves us. And three days later, which next week we will celebrate, he got out of that grave and the same spirit that rose Christ from the grave will come and live inside of you and give you life today. 
So when death comes knocking at your door, that's just a graduation to be with him forever. That's who Jesus is. And that's what he came to do. You see, in a moment, we're gonna go into communion as a church. And a communion is a beautiful time to picture what we just talked about, where Jesus says, here's the wine. It's a representation of my blood. And here's the bread. It's a representation of my body. My body was beaten and my blood was shed. And so when you partake in these things, you remind yourself, not only what I did for you back in Egypt, but what I do for you today, that you have been covered because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And if you're here and you don't follow Christ, we wanna ask you maybe just to take this time of communion to maybe ponder to yourself what it would it look like to follow Christ. What would it look like to say, you know what, I think the life I'm living is freedom, but maybe it's not. And maybe the life Christ has for me, even though it seems like restraint, is actually the freedom that God wants to use. See, before we go to communion, we gotta decide that first. There might be people in this room who need to paint their doorpost. Before you leave today, you have a chance to paint your doorpost, to paint your house, to paint your life by putting your faith in Jesus, by saying, I'm a sinner. Jesus, you are a savior. Forgive me today, I choose you. If you wanna pray that prayer with eyes closed, I want you to, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer right now to put your faith in the blood of Jesus, to put your faith in the works of Jesus. This is a simple prayer you pray right now. You just let God know, Lord, I'm a sinner who desperately needs your son, Jesus. He's my savior. Forgive me. Today I'm choosing to paint the doorpost. Today I'm choosing to put my trust in the sacrificed lamb who was slain for me so I could live forever. Between you and God, I just want you to make that real. You say, God, I'm choosing to follow you. I put my faith in you. Thank you for your grace. Remember, it's not works. It's just a belief and beginning to follow Jesus at his word. Lord, we thank you for those who are making that decision right now. We thank you for it, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go into a time of communion. We have communion at the front of the stages and we have tables all around that you can take with your family. You can pray together and remind yourself of what Jesus has done. We're gonna have a song, but after this song, I want you to stay where you are because if you pray that prayer, we're gonna give you a moment to respond. We're gonna give you a moment to respond to what God has done in your life. It's gonna be a beautiful moment. So right now, we're gonna take a moment and remind ourselves what Jesus did on that cross through communion.
for your sacrifice. It's easy, Lord, in this season just to run and forget what you've done. So, Lord, whether it be with our family or by ourselves, Lord, let's remind ourselves of the sacrifice you made. And we give our eyes fixed on you when life is heavy, when it's easy, when it's tough, when we're in the mountaintop or in the valley, so that you would strengthen us in those places. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, before we continue on and give you a few things, if you made a decision to paint your doorpost, if you said, to, this is the day I chose to follow Christ. Man, I remember doing that when I was 19 years old. And even though I was raised in church, it was the moment I said, this is my faith. This is the, this is the Jesus I'm following. I realized I was a sinner who desperately needed a savior. If that's you today, we just wanna put a resource in your hand before you leave. And so what we're gonna do is ask you to do something really bold. Kind of three, we're gonna ask you to lift up your hand right where you are. We're not gonna embarrass you. We just wanna celebrate you and clap along with you. And in that three seconds of courage, we have a resource to put in your hand. It's gonna help you get connected with our church, some resources that's gonna explain the decision you made and hopefully help you with your journey in Christ. So if you could be bold at the count of three, that would help us tremendously. One, Jesus loves you. Two, he died rose again. Three, if you said, I prayed the prayer, I made a decision to uh, trust in Jesus Christ. If that was you, I want you to throw your hand up as high as possible so our ushers can see you and so we can celebrate you. If you're online, there's a link that you can click. Amen, amen. Let's thank Jesus one more time for the sacrifice he made for us. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Here at Bell, we believe that everyone has a next step. And if you look at the Z-Back pocket in front of you, there's a red card that says, my next step. And maybe it's joining in the community. Maybe it's getting baptized. Also on that card, if you need prayer, and fill that card out, we would love to pray for you. We have a team that prays all week for the prayer requests that we get. And as we kind of conclude today's worship experience, once again, come out next week for Easter. We believe it's gonna be an incredible weekend, 4 and 5.30 on Saturday. Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.45. Be in prayer for the team as we prepare for this next week. Um, and if you need a prayer, our prayer team is right up front. They would love to pray for you. But for everyone else, we're gonna keep the room down a little bit. So if you wanna stay in here, talk, recap today's message, feel free to do that. But for everyone else, I'll see you next week. God bless you. You are dismissed.